I'll tell you a little story uh, that uh, is rather humorous about us. This was in the middle 1960s, and when we were making uh, one of the documentaries called uh, Mayhem on a Sunday Afternoon, which was about professional football, we went to the training camp of the, of the Cleveland Browns, which was a very important football team then uh, in the National Football League, and we stayed where the Browns were training was uh, in a little town outside of Akron, Ohio, in the Middle West. So those of your viewers who understand about the Middle West know that it's quite provincial and uh, very sort of conservative. And we came in, the th uh, a very small crew that I brought, John and a man called Villas Lapinex, who was a, also a, a cameraman, myself and a sound man called Nigel Noble, who was from England. Villas was from Latvia, and John was from Mexico. And the four of us looked really like a band of gypsies. And the people there had no idea. We were staying at a motel, and they were all curious about what we were doing there. We came in with all these boxes of equipment. Nothing was said about what we were doing, which was to film the practices of this football team and interview the players as part of following them around for a season. But in the local hotel where we stayed, there was a restaurant. And we'd go down to breakfast every morning, and there would be all these young girls standing outside the windows of the restaurant of the motel staring at us. And we told them nothing about who we were, but they were terribly curious. And they would ask, and we would, you know, just say we couldn't, we're on a secret mission. And Finally, more and more of these young women and then young men started popping up. And one of the girls came up to me and said, are you fellas rock stars? Because all of these guys had long hair. Uh, they were sawed off guys. It was the, the 1960s hippies. As I say, we all looked like hippies and gypsies, especially John Alonzo. And I said, just to make conversation and throw them off the track, I said, have you ever heard of a group called Herman's Hermits, which was a very popular, stupid singing group from England at the time. Uh, and they had a hit song called Ennery the Eighth. And um, they said, are you Herman's Hermits? And we said, you guessed it, you got it. So now the whole town started to gather around us and hang out, and every time we'd get in the car, with all this camera and sound equipment and, you know, lighting equipment similar to what you have. And we'd get in the car and drive off, and, and they would say, what are you go where are you going? What are you doing? We'd say, well, you know, we're making a video out here. And uh, <laughs> they had no idea that, you know, we were a crew and not Herman's Hermits. But they kept prodding us to sing the Herman's Hermits hit song for them. And they, they brought a piano into this restaurant when we came back from shooting one day. And John Alonzo, Villas Lapinex, Nigel Noble, and I got around the piano, and we started singing choruses of Herman's Hermits. Uh, I'm Henry the Eighth, I am. Henry the Eighth, I am, I am. I got married to the girl next door. She was married seven times before and everyone was an Ennery. She didn't want a Willie or a Sam. I'm an eighth old man, I'm Ennery. Ennery the eighth I am. And they went crazy. They couldn't believe it. And some of them were looking at us because it sounded about as awful as I, I did it. And, and I, they were looking at us strangely and I said, well, you know, in the recording studio it sounds a lot better. But for one week that we were there, this entire town believed that we were Herman's Hermits and we signed autographs. At night, you had all of these girls and women staring in. We were all on the first floor of a, of a motel and they stare in at us. And I, I remember John in particular who ha used to play the guitar sometimes. And he was pretty good, you know, and he started singing in Spanish. <laughs> to gatherings of these people. And I remember that as one of the most pleasant, fun shoots that we ever 
did together. But that was a key to John as well. He loved to have fun. Every time we'd go off to film a documentary, uh, it was for us an adventure and an education, and it, it was like boys' night out. John had by that time, the time that we did The Guardian together, he had become a real um, world-class cinematographer. Uh, he still was a very modest and humble person, but he, he knew what he knew. And he was no longer like the student that I had worked with early on, someone who was more or less searching for what he knew. John had found quick and simple ways of doing things, of lighting a scene without a lot of muss and fuss. And he had, he had the same crew with him all the time. And he would have to say very little to his crew. He would just often point. He'd, he'd go like that. He'd use his hands and say, you know, a couple of those, one from over here, maybe one back here. And that's all he'd say. And that was a shorthand code for how to set the lights. You know, and uh, the crew knew what he wanted. And the great secret of anyone working on a film at that level, whether it's a director of photography or sound man or, or even a director, is to work simply. The people you see running around making a lot of noise, giving a lot of orders, uh, uh, trying to uh, take over and be the boss, those aren't the real masters. The masters are the ones that say and do very little and things happen all around them as if, you know, by osmosis. John liked long lenses and he would often suggest the use of certain lenses and he was always very anxious to show me something he had discovered about a certain lens and what it could do and how we could use it to achieve what's called montage within a frame. Montage generally implies putting together one shot next to another, next to another, to build up a sequence. John was very fond of doing montage within the camera frame itself. So you could move from a close-up of someone to a wide shot, take that person into a, a, a group of people that becomes a wide shot, and then move somewhere else with them that reveals something else, all without a cut. And it's generally the desire of most um, really capable cinematographers to want to do as much within a single frame that they've, that they've composed without a lot of cuts. Because the cinematographer's problem in making a, f a motion picture is to hold on to a quality of light that's consistent. And as we know, the light is always changing. So if you take a shot from over there, let's say, on me and you're looking at the background over there and then you want to come around and make another angle from over here or over there it's often an hour or so later and the light will have changed you know the light is ever changing now this seems like a beautiful soft lit gray day which John Alonzo loved most cinematographers love gray days where the light is even and there aren't long shadows although that can be used too in a certain kind of film but uh, every time you move the camera to make another angle you're risking having to rebalance the light because the light as I say is ever changing so John had become very aware of this by that time and would always encourage me to try and get a scene done within one viewpoint within one frame and I, I like that approach John on a set was a very paternal figure, uh, even when he was younger. He would give the actors and actresses and the people who were in front of the camera a great feeling of security, a great feeling that he understood what they were doing and that he would um, mold his own work to not interrupt or to not get in the way of of what he understood their style and technique to be. So I remember how he, he would always make actors and actresses feel uh, a, a great emotional bond with him so that they trusted him. That's a great quality a, cinema, a cinematographer needs. 
because a cinematographer has to work very much like a spy. You have to make the actors think that you're doing, that your first obligation is to make them comfortable. But what you're really doing, your first obligation, is to get a look for this film that works, that's been agreed on with the producer and the director. And John was able to achieve his effects very simply without making the actors feel that they had to compromise so that he could get his shot. That was his secret. Uh, but his secret was also based on the fact that he had a genuine admiration and understanding of the work of everyone on the crew and a respect for it. Uh, he had come up through the ranks. As you said, he was an actor. He had many jobs on the camera before he was able to take pictures. You know, he was a film loader, and uh, uh, he was uh, a camera assistant. He was a focus puller. Uh, he worked I in many facets of the camera before he was allowed to operate it and then to just light for the camera because all those functions here are separate and you work your way up. John always liked to pick up the camera himself even after he had become a director of photography. He liked to look through the lens and he, he loved the handheld camera and to move with the actors uh, holding the camera himself. In those days the cameras were a lot heavier than they are now so it was a bit more difficult. But uh, John always made it a point to stay very close to the people who manufactured this equipment, namely the Panaflex and Araflex camera companies. Um, and so they would let him try out new equipment. He'd always be down at Araflex or Panaflex, looking at a new camera, trying out a new shoulder grip for a handheld camera. And they would allow John to experiment and they would take his notes for modifications. So while he was doing that, he was also going to the labs, to Technicolor and Deluxe Laboratories and others here and talking to the film timers so that wherever a film was going to be timed at whatever lab the studio chose, uh, the film timers knew what John was looking for. And again, without a lot of words, the film is ultimately achieved in the lab, the look of it. You can go out and try to make an image that, as I say, is supposed to have a, a kind of a burnished glow. And if the lab timer doesn't understand that, he could change the whole color look of the film and therefore the emotional response to it that was desired by the director and the cinematographer. So as I say, John, everyone at the labs and the equipment houses knew John. So he had all the technical people on his side. And a lot of the equipment that's used today was modified because of John's suggestions. And then, most importantly, he was able to get the actors and people on his side so that uh, they could feel that uh, they weren't puppets but they were uh, free to do their thing while John just captured it. It's, it's all a very interesting, deceptive process. Most actors understand nothing about how the camera works or how editing goes together. They're there to give a performance. The performance is often filmed out of sequence. By that I mean out of the re regular story sequence from beginning to middle and end. You'll sometimes film the middle first, then the end, and later the beginning for a variety of scheduling reasons. And so actors come to the set, even the biggest stars, with so a lot of insecurity. They don't know how their work is going to be ultimately used. It could be used well or poorly. A performance can be enhanced or ruined in the cinematography or in the cutting room. But uh, most of the very best actors always wanted to work with John. Uh, I'm very happy you guys are doing this and that he's going to um, hopefully get the attention that, and the interest that he deserves because um, very often uh, uh, to paraphrase uh, 
Shakespeare and Julius Caesar, uh, the evil that men do lives behind them. The good is often teared with their bones. And the good work that a great film artist does very often gets forgotten when he's no longer with us and not constantly working. But I think John Alonzo's films can be continuously studied by students of film, people interested in the art of film, who will then themselves come along and uh, produce original work. So I'm, I'm very happy you're doing this.